Welcome back to Better Than Before. This is Tony Richards and excited to welcome a special guest today on the program from MFA Oil. He works in their hedging department as a commodity guy and he can tell us more about it. But Tim Danzy is here on the program with us today. Tim, welcome to the show. Thanks, Tony. Appreciate the invite. You bet. Now, what is your official title at MFA Oil Company? I believe it's hedging manager for whatever that's worth. He thinks it is. Okay. Just want to tell everybody that this is not investment advice for you or anything like that. We got to put the disclaimer out there that we're just talking about what's going on in the world today from a commodity standpoint and specifically oil and and stuff like that. And I'm just interested in Tim's background a little bit because he deals in this kind of stuff. So are you originally a Missourian? Were you born in the state of Missouri? I am not. I'm originally from Omaha, Nebraska, so I'm a Nebraskan. And I'm unique in the fact that I'm one of the few that's not a Go Big Red fan. Oh, yeah. So you're not a big end guy. No, no, no. Black and gold all the way. Yeah, because I know you went to Mizzou. Right. And so is that how you got to Missouri? Was that you were recruited and you went to Mizzou to play baseball? That's absolutely correct, yeah. Yeah, I remember those years. (laughs) <laughs> I was back there in the same kind of time period. Right, absolutely. What yeah. year did you graduate? Um, 85, yep. I was done. Me too. That's our our time period. What did you do after college then? I think like a lot of people. I mean, I was interested in sales. I wanted to be a sales person. So I've come the long way, man. I banged out the cold call selling copiers. Mm-hmm. Did that for a while. I took a break and I actually went back and coached baseball for a couple of years here at Mizzou. Oh, you did? I yeah. did. I did. What years were those? Um, that would have been like 87, 88, right in there. I worked for a little while and then came back and did that, which was a ton of fun. A I lot mean, of it's, fun, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's a lot of hard work and a lot of time, which we all know coaches put in a lot yeah. of time. You still go to the games here? I do. I try to. I need to be way better. I'm certainly a Missouri Tiger fan, Missouri Tiger baseball fan. Yeah. Need to get out there more than I have. Yeah, I went out there last year when Kentucky played, and then uh, I think uh, Arkansas, not Arkansas University, but another school from Arkansas was there. So I enjoy going out and watching them play. Well, as you well know, the SEC is way good in baseball. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, lots of good teams there. So how'd you get in this business? How'd you get in the investment world? Um... I mean, I I did sales and I got into energy sales and I've done the whole gamut and sold lubricants and of course, gasoline, diesel fuel, propane. And then that kind of transitioned over time into, I became a marketer, which essentially was selling fixed forward prices to customers. And then some things happened and I was with a company that got merged and they wanted people to move North. I was in a position not to move North to Minnesota. Didn't have anything against Minnesota. It's just my kids were of an age. I didn't want to move them. So that kind of opened the door for me to kind of slip in the back to get on the other side of selling a contract to somebody is how did you manage that risk? How do you deal with that from a, you know, a a risk perspective, a financial perspective? And so that's kind of how that started for me. So what kind of attributes does someone need to have in order to be successful in what you do? You kind of got to be able to analyze certain things, right? And of course, all these markets now are global. So anything that happens in the world is a potential impact on that. So that's important too. And then you got to be willing to have an opinion, take your move and live or die with that. And I'm not saying that that's death experience or anything, but you know, you'll have some things that won't go the way you expect them to go. And and you got to be able to deal with that. Yeah. I was listening to a guy on another podcast the other day who was a trader And he reads the conference calls. He reads like 30 of them a day or something like that. That's a little bit different than what you do, but I'm sure you still have to do some of that. I do. I mean, information is, you know, information's power. And that's why you see so many of these information services now. And we subscribe to some stuff. I mean, you can spend all day doing that. Yeah. I think people are looking for, okay, take this whole deal and boil it down to me and feed it to me. And and we do some of that. But I spend a lot of time searching the news What's impacting the energy market? Trump is every day something you never know what he's going to do that could impact the market. So you got to be able to take all that and kind of boil it down to what's important to you and what do you do to help manage your business. And of course, ours is a hedging perspective, trying to level the playing field for MFA oil. Sure. So oil is obviously a commodity. What are other commodities that are out there? Corn, soybeans, sure. what else? Corn, soybeans, rice, uh, cattle. Gold, yeah. silver, palladium, all them, you know, you got a whole slug of them. 
when I started thinking about managing my own money, I went to a guy to kind of teach me and mentor me. And of course, this is just his perspective. One of the first things he said was, stay out of the commodity market. He's like, it's dangerous. It's awful. And he told me the story about a guy in Texas who I guess got addicted and lost his farm and ranch and got millions of dollars in debt. What is it about the commodities market that makes it so dangerous? I think the biggest thing is it's highly leveraged and it can be extremely volatile. We've just went through an OPEC meeting. I mean, in the past, something could happen at an OPEC meeting and prices could move violently. The other thing is, is I don't even know what it is now because it's going so large, but you know, these markets have a stop. They get to a certain point, they've moved so much, they shut down. Right. Well, in energy, that's just gotten where I I don't know. It's like 10 bucks in crude or something. It's a big number. So a lot can happen in a short amount of time. Yeah. Two years ago, what, we had $35 oil or something like that. And now we're almost back to 70. How does that affect just regular Joe guys like us? Obviously, you know, some of that's figured into our gas prices, stuff like that. Do we really need to be cognizant of what oil prices are? Um, I mean, I think it has some implications on people's view of the global economy. I think the other thing is, is for whatever reason, energy, gas prices, crude prices, that seems to be like a a real hot button with a lot of people. Yeah, I don't know that everybody gets all upset about cattle prices until they get to the steak section of the store. Yeah, but, you know, you're still going to buy it. And I mean, we all have to buy gas. Maybe that's it. You know, we get it on a daily basis of, you know, somebody's concern that gas prices are too high. And, you know, we all know the story of the guy that watches it religiously and he drives 50 miles over here to save a penny. I mean, it's just a really, really hot button with people for some reason. You're not necessarily in that kind of business, but there are guys who do what you do on a scale where like just a dime's difference makes a big deal. They could be leveraged in for like just a few pennies. They could buy and sell on that or short sell it or whatever. Absolutely. And of course, you know, with computers now doing a lot of that, I think you're talking about one or two ticks can make a difference for some of those folks. Yeah, yeah. You deal primarily with oil. So what is going on with the oil markets right now? You mentioned we just had an OPEC meeting. Right. So what else is going on? with? That's that? been the biggest thing. And that just happened on Friday and Saturday. That's certainly front and center. Bottom line is OPEC agreed to produce an extra million barrels of oil starting in July. Depending upon whose opinion, and there are several, that amounts to call it six hundred to 700,000 additional barrels. Some people think that's enough. Some don't. You know, there's a lot of factors that play into that. But the market's trying to digest all that right now, figure out what does that really mean. And what it boils down to is what's Saudi Arabia going to do? That's the big question. Beyond that, this whole China trade war thing is a big deal. How does that play out? And does that impact crude prices? So them are kind of the two hot topics fresh in the market right now. I've been a little distracted over the last several months, but I know not long ago, maybe a year ago, We had more oil than we knew what to do with. I mean, all the tanks were full. All the coastline refineries were all running. Everything was full. Like, has some of that supply come down, or do we still have as much as we've had? In terms of crude oil, we're still pretty abundant here in the U.S., and of course, that's all shell, mostly. West Texas is booming again. I think I read just recently they're at record production problem they got now is they got so much they don't have enough pipelines to move it somewhere so that's kind of created a bottleneck but in terms of just crude oil here in the u.s Mm -hmm. we're still at a pretty high level gas supplies are pretty good the one that's a little iffy is diesel fuel it's kind of on the lower end of the curve and you know that's kind of a concern for our business certainly since we're diesel heavy i saw somebody the other day talking about how the supply had gone down just a little bit so the oil guys can ratchet up just a tad or whatever and i'm like they're not going to ratchet up a tad those guys are born to get that stuff out of the ground man you give them an inch they're going for a mile you know they're going to be drilling well and i chuckle every now and then just because just what you said this has been a boomer bust business for a long time and that's kind of the mentality of guys that are attracted to it i think you're right in some of that are you a nine to five guy or does this stuff go through your head when you're not working i think i've gotten better maybe shutting it off you know you're always kind of thinking about stuff how have you gotten better at it i mean what have you done to kind of make yourself realize there's more to life than all this ticker stuff going (laughs) all the time um i think some of that is the environment that i've worked in 
people I've talked to, I mean, this can be an extremely high stress business. Guys that are traders, you know, that can be extremely high stress. So that's part of that. I mean, I've seen guys that I used to think about these guys that would say, well, I got up at three o'clock last night to check my position. And, you know, you hear that two or three times and you're like, is this really that important? Yeah. That I got to get up at three. Well, you worked in companies before, though, that that's all they right, did. Right. With MFA oil, it's a small part of what they do. Right. And the other thing is, is we take a pretty longer term view of yeah. the market. We're trying to think ahead and we're very conservative. So we sure. take a little bit longer term view. We pay attention every day, but in the grand scheme of things, we're trying to be a little bit longer term focus on what we're trying to plan and prepare for. Just to be a better professional overall, what's a couple of things you think you need to work on? For me personally? Yeah. Ooh, those are tough. I mean, you can always learn. I need to learn more. And I know there's some smart people out there that I've worked with and I work with now that I need to learn. Sure. And you got to be open to that. That's part of that too. That'd be one thing. The other thing is, is, you know, I'm at that age where I'm not super technology and, you know, we got some young kids that are pretty sharp, some things like that, that could help in terms of being willing to embrace technology and and use that to get more educated information. Who has been somebody that's been a real mentor to you in this journey you've been on in this career? Boy, that's a tough one for me. I'd say the biggest influence for me personally has been my father, Yeah, right? Which hopefully a lot of us would say. How's he influenced you? What are some of the things you think you've learned from him or picked up from him? I, I think they're kind of simple old adages. You know, you show up, you do the work. Yeah, sure. You know, you bet. Yeah. That's emotional for me. Sorry. Yeah, you bet. What's the biggest thing you got to think about on a daily basis with what you do? As I said, we've got a little bit longer term focus, so I don't know if there's anything that's pressing. But as I said before, this is a global business. It's impacted globally. So you kind of got to stay abreast because who knows what could happen anywhere in the world tomorrow, five minutes from now. That's kind of the biggest thing. And I mean, we do have some positions we manage on a more day to day basis. Short term, longer term, I mean, you just kind of got to be abreast of something that may go on. You know, you have a hurricane or OPEC did something crazy over the weekend. I mean, that can have a substantial impact on the energy markets. I'm in the MFA oil building quite a bit. I love going to Tim's office because he's got this big map over by his desk with all these (laughs) pipelines and stuff on it. I like looking at that. When you played baseball, what are some of the things you think you learned in college baseball that helped you? Were you tight with your coaches? Nah, that's that's kind of a relative term. I have a lot of respect. I think maybe that's a better way for me to put it. Yeah. I wasn't afraid to talk to him or ask questions. I wouldn't say we were best of friends or anything like that. Something about it caused you to go back and want to help coach. Deep down, I think it's all about I want to help people. Yeah. You know, and I feel that way today even still. You know, learn how to do hard work. Got to show up and do stuff when you don't want to. Yep. Man, are you amazed at some of the tools they have to work with today? Yeah. I mean, I've been over there, and I know you have too, and some of the stuff they've got to now practice with and use to help them and tape, and it's awesome. It's crazy. I I got a newsletter, and I read about the first four paragraphs, and about half the things they said in there, I had no idea what they were, and most of that was new technology. Yeah. So, yeah, they're they're doing good. At MFA Oil, you guys are pretty conservative on this kind of stuff, this, that, and the other. But when you were doing this on a regular basis, how did you figure out risk? I mean, how did you figure out how much risk you're willing to take? Big thing that drives that is who are you working with? Mm-hmm. Who's your client? Because then ultimately that's who you were doing you know, your stuff for as the client. And, and it's their assets, right? Right, exactly. So most everybody that's dealing with a thing like this has some type of policy or something along those lines that have criteria. So that's a big thing. We're that same way. We have a risk policy and we have sure. certain levels that we got to work within. So that's probably the biggest thing. You occasionally have somebody you deal with that is a little bit more free. That can be a real challenge because the assumption is everybody wants to do this to make money. Right. And sometimes that can be a challenge. Being a hedger and trying to mitigate risk is a little bit more easy, in my opinion. Yeah. The one thing I've always heard about the markets that always stuck with me is that they're the opposite of the casino. So in the market, 
all you hear about are the losers. You don't hear too much about the winner. And there's more winners than losers most of the time in the market. But at the casino, what do you hear about? You hear about the one big winner and there's more losers <laughs> at the casino than there are winners. But more people are more willing to go to a casino than they are to try to make some money in the market. Is there a fallacy that people have about the markets? I think that's what makes the markets really interesting is there are so many opinions. Mm -hmm. Just like on a daily basis, I can read that crude oil is going to 100 bucks and turn the page and somebody else thinks it's going to 50. I mean, there's a lot of variety of opinions. And of course, that's what makes the market. It's a, it's a little sexy. Yeah, yeah, it is. And I, I think the big thing is, like you said, the people that think they can make a bunch of money. Yeah. Of course, we read all about these hedge fund guys now. So that's a big deal. You know, hedge fund guy makes a billion dollars. Well, that... That's what people know. That's what they think the market is, you know? Yeah. Do you remember your first trade? Mm, boy, I'm not sure I do. That's really? a long time ago. Gosh, I'll never forget <laughs> it. I never forget the first time I punched that button and that number started squiggling around and I just shut it off. I'm like, oh, I can't do this it's too exciting, you know? Right. I think it's pretty cool. Well, yeah. And of course, you know, for me, it was probably an easy decision. I was covering something for somebody. So it's like, hey, we're going to buy this. Okay, great. Well, I need to sell this. It yeah. was kind of automatic. You bet. So I got a standard list of closing questions I'm going to ask you that okay. I ask everybody that comes on the okay. show. Is this rapid fire, quick uh, response? Rapid fire, man. Okay. As fast as you can, okay. but give it some thought if you have to. Okay. Best memory that immediately comes to mind for you? Playing catch in the backyard with my dad. Good. Number one hero in your life? My dad. Okay. Top value you subscribe to? Integrity. Most important person in your life? My wife. And your wife's name? Christy. Christy. Your favorite thing in the whole world? Favorite thing? Pass. <laughs> favorite food? Pizza. All right. Most beautiful place you've ever been to? Colorado. If you could describe success in one word, what would it be? I don't want this to sound bad, but contentment. Contentment. I like it. How do you want to be remembered? As an outstanding husband and father. Advice for a younger Tim Danzy. Mm, stay on the grind. Be patient. Do the work. What's your favorite sound? Mm, crack of a bat. Get some uh, baseball. I like it. And finally, what's the best lesson you've ever learned? Best lesson, I think, is you're going to get knocked down. you got to get back up and keep working. I love it. Tim Danzy, thanks for being on today, man. I appreciate it. I appreciate you. I appreciate our friendship. Receive weekly coaching tips from Tony Richards, delivered straight to your inbox. Whether you're a CEO or an entrepreneur, Tony can help you reach your goals and give you a competitive edge within your industry. Tony's Monday Morning Coaching Memo covers topics ranging from leadership development to teamwork to company culture and more. Text the word leadership to 38470 to sign up for Tony's Monday Morning Coaching Memo or sign up online at clearvisiondevelopment.com.